Elementary music teacher friend, you love what you do, but you might feel unappreciated and, in fact, unseen some days. You may even feel like you're on a music teacher island and just want to connect with other music teachers who can relate to both your struggles and wins when it comes to teaching elementary music. I get you and understand completely the feelings you're having. That's why each and every week, the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast will provide you with solo and guest episodes that will help you realize you're not alone in your music teaching journey. Throughout each episode, my goal is for you to be able to walk away with actionable steps and ideas to help you feel like you're ready to take on the new week with whatever challenges may be thrown your way. Hi, I'm your host, Jessica Peresta, and I'm so glad you're here. Whether you're at home, in your car, in the shower, or wherever else you're listening, grab your cup of coffee or whatever other beverage is nearby and listen in to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. Hi, I'm Adam Geis. I'm David Lurch. We're hosts of the EdTech Distilled Podcast, which is a part of the Education Podcast Network. Shows on the network are individually owned. Opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. I am so excited to be back today. And we're going to talk about those wiggly students. What do you do with them? How can you teach when you have what I lovingly refer to some of them as spinners in your room or those who cannot keep their bottoms planted on your floor? You all know what I'm talking about. I want to preface this by uh, this episode by saying, like I say a lot on this podcast, you know your students better than anyone. So some of these strategies I'm going to share with you that I actually shared with a teacher that went through my course, she asked this question about how to work with energy students with a lot of energy levels and they have a hard time sitting still. I shared some advice with her that I, that worked for me. There is no perfect day. There is no perfect class period. There's no perfect approach. So like anything else I share, take the strategies that work for you or that you think would work for you, that you think might work for your students, and then just ignore the rest, okay? I also want you to remember, like I said, you know your students better than anyone. So sometimes students are wiggly for different reasons. Sometimes they're just kids and they just are wiggly. Let's think about those kindergartners, right? And first graders, they have a lot of energy. A lot of this also depends on when in the school day they come into your classroom. Is it after recess? Is it towards the end of the day where they're just kind of ready to go home? Is it, think about what time of the school year you're at. If it's nearing summer, you're going to have a lot more wiggly issues from students of all grade levels, not just kindergarten. And so when I'm talking about ideas in this episode, I want you to keep those things in mind. I also want you to remember individual students you're aware of who maybe do have ADHD or who maybe are on some kind of behavior plan and they have a hard time keeping them hand, their hands to themselves or whatever else it might be. You also may have kiddos on the spectrum who are wiggly for that reason. So I want you to consider all of this when you hear the advice I'm going to share. Young kids have a lot of energy. So in order to help them with this, here are a few things you can focus on if you have not, even as soon as next school year. Less talking by you. So this sounds counterintuitive and you're like, but what do you mean? I'm the teacher. I have to talk. Yes, of course you do. But when is the last time you have done less talking and more doing? There is a whole episode about that on this podcast. So scroll back and look for that. But what I mean is if you're spending a lot of time standing at the front of the classroom, think about the education system from 20 years ago. That's most of what my teachers did. They were teaching at the front of the classroom. Yes, even in the music room while we sat our bottoms in the chair. Education has come a long way, thankfully. And of course, every teacher's personality is different. But if you're spending the majority of your class period standing at the front of the room while your students are sitting on the floor, especially those younger students, they are going to be wiggly. They have sometimes short attention spans, not sometimes all the time. They are going to start tuning you out if you're standing up there and talking, talking, talking instructions. This is what we're doing today. Look at the board. Let's follow this. And they still have not stood up or done anything with their hands or done anything with their bodies or their feet or their mouth for that matter. And haven't had the opportunity to sing or haven't had the opportunity to talk or share in a small group. 
you need to incorporate these ideas and these strategies into your lessons uh, so students are not just sitting still all the time. So think about the amount of talking you are doing as the teacher and how can you incorporate more collaborative group work, small group work, partner activities, or even when you're doing whole class instruction, how can you have your students doing something where they're not just sitting and listening? Better transitions in the music room will also help with wiggly students. When students know where to go and what to do and what to do when they're getting to the new activity or whatever it is, they need to have better transitions. So what does that mean? Well, transitions can be your students, let's stomp to the beat while we go to the new activity. We're going to pat our shoulders. I want you to twirl in a circle, make it fun. Sing this verse on the way to this new activity or on the way to your new instrument or on the way to make a circle. Have better transitions. If you're just saying, okay, we've sang this song. Now I want us to all pick up our instruments. Well, the minute you say that, the minute the students bend down and pick up their instruments, you're going to lose half the class. The minute you are instructing them what to do, they're going to start, you know, shaking their egg shaker or hitting their drum. Well, how can a better transition happen between, let's say, as an example, singing and getting their instruments? Well, first of all, we already talked about less talking. So could you show them? You can give quick instructions. I'm not saying don't talk at all. So But instead of saying, okay, we sang this song, now we're going to pick up our instruments and play this rhythm, you can say, we sang this, now do this, and you model it. You're going to bend over, pick up your instrument, and you're going to stand there quietly. And then you point at your students and you say, your turn. And then the students who do it right get to keep their instruments. The students who, you know, started kicking it across the room or whatever else, you can point at them and say, uh, uh, or go tap their shoulders and say, you do, do it again. Just whisper in their ear, do it again. And if they do it again, you can say, good job. And then you keep going or whatever else works for you. But better transitions, if they're moving from one spot in the classroom to another spot in the classroom, have a transition on how they're going to get there. How are they going to get their instruments? What are they going to do when they have the instruments? What are the procedures you need to have in place? So better transitions. Think about how you can do that. Keep them engaged and moving. This starts from before the students even enter into the classroom get them in the hallway. I had an ongoing, what I mean is get them in the hallway. I have have them doing something with their bodies before they even walk in. I have an ongoing body percussion warm up I did with my students every single day, every day. So what happened is they would have it memorized. They would just immediately start doing it when they stood in the hallway, knowing that's what I expected. It was so cool to see. So they would start in the hallway, move into the music room, already moving their bodies. Movement is a lot of different avenues, right? You have creative movement, you have folk dances, you have students improvising movement, and body percussion, in my opinion, is movement. So when I say keep them engaged in moving, have them doing something with their bodies, even if it is as simple as stomping the beat. If they are sitting down while you give instructions, have them pat the beat on their legs. So they're doing something with their bodies while they're listening. Yes, some students have a hard, hard time multitasking, but others need that movement. They need to do something with their hands so they can focus on doing something musical instead of focusing on I'm tuning her out or him out and I'm moving in a circle on the floor. So think about the ways you're keeping your students engaged in moving in the music room from the moment before they even step into the door until they leave. How are they, how are you keeping them engaged? How are you asking them questions? How are you getting them to respond? How are you in providing ways for them to talk? Yes, they need to talk. They cannot just hold, like stay in complete silence the whole 45 minutes or whatever your class period is. So provide engagement opportunities and movement opportunities on an ongoing basis to allow them time to get their wiggles out and their noises out and their talking out. They need those opportunities. Also, don't have a lot of downtime. This ties in perfectly when we're talking about transitions in the music room. Do not have a lot of downtime. And what I mean by this is we have all forgotten our lesson plan format. We've all forgotten the sequence of instruction. Okay, I put here, I was going to teach this song and do this movement. Oh my gosh, what was that movement activity? I totally forgot. And you sit down the minute you look down or say, I need to walk to my desk to get something or whatever else, you're going to lose them. 
So how do you not have a lot of downtime? Well, by the way, those moments come. <laughs> so when they do come, have a plan in place. Point at a student, come up here, lead this body percussion. Boom, they're doing something. Or instead of, oh, wait a minute, I forgot to set up the instruments in the corner. If you have those moments come, they're called brain farts. They're going to come, y'all. They're going to happen. But have a plan in place for what are you going to do when those, uh, I don't want to say disasters, but moments happen in your classroom. Have some students just already pinpointed in your mind that can come up and lead an activity while you do go in course correct. Or when I say not a lot of downtime, well, don't say, oh my gosh, we have five to 10 minutes left at the end of class. You're going to have students get super wiggly, right? Have some filler activities planned and ready to go that you can pull out of your bucket, pull out of your hat to do with your students when there is extra time. So they're not just sitting there dilly daddling, if that's even a phrase people use anymore, with you know, like getting distracted, distracting themselves and others. And the last thing I want to say before I talk about um, what to do if they come in after recess or at the end of the day is stay consistent with expectations. I cannot drill this enough. I talk about this. I've talked about it before. Expectations and procedures are huge. It's not just a very beginning of the school year thing. It's an ongoing thing. If your students know what you, you expect from them, sometimes, sometimes, notice I said sometimes, they will rise to the occasion. So give, uh, consistency is key. Have expectations of what do you expect in the music room? Also, if they need to get to the end of the class period and they know there's something coming and they really want to get to it, a lot of times you're going to have the better student focus when they know that, hey, she said the last 15 minutes of class, we're going to be doing this really fun dance. So I want to earn that. And then have also when it goes to expectations, what are your expectations when students do not participate or are not following the procedures? That's important to consider as well. But also, like I mentioned at the beginning, taking into consideration individual student needs. They're not all a blanket approach. There's, there's no one size fits all approach. And so if there are individual students who are just wiggly for various reasons, then know how you're going to help them as well. Maybe it's a fidget toy. Maybe there is some kind of, um, you know, gosh, I forgot what they're called, but the squishy balls, I don't know what they're called, but we have some of those at my house where, you know, they're like stress reliever things, but if they just need something to do with their hands to keep their mind focused, have some, you know, enforcements available that you can easily hand to students if they have a hard time um, sitting still. Okay, so let's talk about coming in after recess or the end of the day when energy levels are just naturally higher. I say end of the day, energy levels are higher, but it's also when I remember, I'll never forget, gosh, getting kindergarten at the very, very end of the day. And you'd have higher energy levels, but I'd also have students falling asleep because they were exhausted. Their little brains were done. And so you have to think about that as well. But what can you do? Let's say you've tried a calming activity when they've come into the classroom to help them settle down a bit and it's not working as well, then flip it. If the calming activity isn't working, try a movement activity at first instead. If their bodies are already still in movement mode, then join them. Do some kind of movement mode to get them to still move around. Then you can start naturally calming them down after that. So if you have not tried that yet, I would, I would suggest it. It does work well. So I hope that you found even, like I said, one nugget of wisdom in this episode, or if anything, these are reminders to keep doing what you're doing or to not give up. There's going to be hard days. There's going to be hard weeks. There's going to be sometimes you've tried every suggestion I mentioned and the kids are still wiggly as ever. That happens. So always have in your bag of tricks some way you can adapt and adjust and if, let's say your lesson plan just isn't working well, then just change it up. Yes, you can even change it up on the fly. It's okay to do that. I really highly suggest that instead of, you know, your students bothering you and you're like, oh my gosh, they won't sit still. Well, have something else to do. Change it up. I can't tell you the amount of times I pivoted and adapted in ways I never thought I would because I knew I needed to reach my students. I could tell immediately if it was one of those hard days that was just like not going well, we would do something different. So it's okay to do that. If you have any questions or need support, make sure you always reach out to me, Jessica at thedomesticmusician.com. I love to hear from you. I love to hear suggestions or questions. Or if you need advice about something, let me know. And I would love to uh, feature your question in a future episode as well. 
Well, hey there. Thank you so much for listening into the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. There is an exclusive Facebook group just for listeners of this podcast and any elementary music teacher called the Elementary Music Teacher Community Facebook Group. Come on over and join us there where we have conversations around the podcast episodes and encourage each other each and every week. And also head to my website, thedomesticmusician.com. I have some free resources there that you can download to help you gain traction in your classroom today as well as the blog and the membership site and all kinds of other goodies to help you keep going in your music teaching journey. I cannot wait to keep connecting with you and encouraging you and spurring you on in your journey of teaching elementary music. Hang in there, have an amazing week, and I will see you soon.